Hello, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 32. My name is Jay Oza, and I'm the host of this show. And uh, we have Julie Finkelstein, who's uh, a regular on this show. And she's a mentor, just like me, for the Coursera's uh, excellent public speaking course called Introduction to Public Speaking. So we are loosely affiliated with that course uh, in a sense that we do mentor it, but this is a community that we have created as a way to help people uh, to, to work more closely and develop their public speaking skills. So we try to do several things uh, in this community, opportunity to share information about public speaking. We also do this uh, weekly show called uh, Speech Talk Live. And uh, the, the whole community as a whole is to learn, to teach, to share, to support, and also to kind of create a, a safe environment, trusting environment, so that nobody feels, uh, you know, like they're going to be ridiculed or criticized or anything like that. Because public speaking, let's face it, it's really hard. It's uh, fearful for a lot of people, for just about everybody. And it can be time consuming and frustrating. So we create this as a way for people to practice and learn at the same time, because I always think of public speaking as a work in progress. You're never really uh, you know, good at it. Uh, I kind of think of it as golf, right? Golf is a game of mistakes. Uh, there are no perfect, it's, very, it's impossible to get a perfect score in golf, right? Uh, and same thing as public speaking. There are no perfect speeches and they are different, just like when you play golf, you play on different courses. Same thing with speaking. Every time you speak, you are in a different setting, different people, different environment, everything changes. So think of speaking like golf, right? If golf is something you play or you understand. So uh, today's uh, agenda is uh, we usually start out by doing a quick intro. And today we just have Julian, so it'll be fast. Uh, and then we move into this uh, segment, we call it the three minute uh, speech segment. Now this is a free open three minute segment where you can talk about any specific topic that you're interested in. And today I'm gonna use it to talk about this uh, method that Jerry Seinfeld uh, used when he was becoming a, a comic. So I'll talk about that in three minutes. And then uh, we're going to move into our a set agenda. And we typically use have three segments. And the first segment, we're going to review a speech that was uh, sent by another mentor uh, for this Introduction to Public Speaking course, Sana, who is uh, based out of uh, Tunisia. And she said, you know, she was wanted somebody to uh, look at the speech and provide some, uh, review it. So I thought it would be a good idea to put it on the show and we can do it as a, you know, as part of the program is one of the segments. So we're going to do that. It's a speech given by Benjamin Bratton. He's a professor at University of California, San Diego. And his speech is about uh, Ted. He's against Ted. And he talks about some of the reasons why he's against Ted. And we'll, we'll, uh, I'll give you my feedback. A feed review. I'll review it, and then Julie can review it, and we'll have a discussion on it. The second segment is... Uh, it's a simple topic, but it could be, it's, it's, it's an important topic. It's like everything that has to be that ultimate question, right? And this idea comes from uh, uh, actually uh, customer service. So we're going to talk about what is the ultimate question when you're giving a speech. You need to know that. It's from the audience point of view. And we're going to talk about depending on what kind of speech you're giving. It could be an intro, could be an impromptu, could be an informative or persuasive. But there has to be that one ultimate question you've got to ask that tells you whether, you are, uh, whether your, your speech is going to be a success or, or, or a failure. In the third segment, uh, it's a little bit uh, kind of inside baseball, perhaps. It's a persuasive speech, but this is tied to the Coursera course, Introduction to Public Speaking. And the reason I wanted to talk about it is because I review quite a few of these speeches, and there are not that many because very few people get that far. But what I've noticed is that they tend to be very good with their stock issues, the, you know, the ill blames and, and consequences and call to action. But there is no emotional persuasion there. So I want to talk about that, why that is the case, what I've observed, and what I think might be the reason. 
and we can have a discussion on that. So that's the show for today. And uh, at this point, I would like uh, Julie to introduce herself, and then we can move to our three-minute uh, speech segment. Uh, Julie? Thank you, Jay. Good morning. Um, so my name is Julie Wu Finkelstein, because sometimes when I say I'm Julie Finkelstein, they expect a European. I'm from Hong Kong, um, China, Canada, Chicago, and here today I'm in Stanford. Um, one of the things I'm doing is I'm writing a book. I'm actually going to do it the way Jay talks about the movie industry, is first you write the trailer, and then you write the book. When you produce a movie, you produce a trailer to get people excited, and then you produce a movie. So I'm creating a book, um, a chishi, or a, a booklet on 10 stretches for love and life, transforming yourself and your life stretch by stretch. That's it. And I'll talk about that later. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, that's good, Julie. I like, uh, I'm, yeah, any help I can provide, just, you know, just ask me. And I'm really looking forward to seeing this book or seeing its progress. So I'm going to keep asking you how your book's going. <laughs> and just a quick update. I uh, forgot to mention that I am also uh, working on a book. So as you can see, we are potential authors here besides speakers. <laughs> so we're stretching this to the next level here. So uh, my book is actually going to be very topical. It's going to be about public speaking. Now, writing a book, as many of you probably know, is really difficult uh, for a number of reasons because it's like uh, it, 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 you really it's testing yourself because you got to find time. Uh, anyway, I don't want to go into too many details of that. But uh, this first book is going to be essentially my journey as a speaker, and I talk about the Coursera course. What I do not do is I don't duplicate what's already taught in the course because. If it's done well, you don't want to take it. And I do simplify some of the stuff that I've noticed, but I don't go into it in the detail that you would get taking the course uh, that Dr. McGarity teaches on the Coursera platform, because that's a 10-week course, and I'm not going to duplicate what he has done. So I talk about my journey, and in a process, uh, I think it'll help people who want to become, uh, I would call it, let's say, if you're adequate, you go from adequate to good, and then you keep continuing, and you become you know, a great speaker. So at this point, I'm going to take a pause, and we're going to move into our three-minute uh, speech segment. OK, welcome back to Speech Talk Live, episode number 32. And at this point, we're going to do our three-minute uh, speech segment. Uh, today, my topic is somewhat related to something that I had talked about in the past. So as I, and, and this is again something that's going to be in my book, uh, when people ask me, you know, if I want to take this course and become a, a, a let's say, I call it good to great speaker, uh, what do I do? And, you know, I, I have my thing, I say, well, first you got to make a goals video, you got to have a goals on what you really, like, why do you want to become a good speaker? What are you trying to, is it a hobby? Is it something related to uh, influence, persuade, connect, whatever, sell? And then I said, you need that because you have to go back and find somebody who will keep you accountable. So goals video is very important. And record that and keep it private. And, that's, and the second thing I say is that then after that, you want to take this Coursera course, uh, Introduction to Public Speaking. It's a 10-week course. And find time. Otherwise, don't take it because it is a pretty intense course. And if you want to do it, if you want to learn it, you're going to have to spend the time. And I have said minimum. I've calculated is if you're taking it for the first time, you, you, Plan on spending between 100 to 150 hours if you really want to go from adequate to good. But then what happens afterwards? Then I said, well, afterwards, you got to really have to develop and turn this into a habit. And then I came up with this something called 330 Challenge, where you basically record a three-minute uh, video for 30 straight days and turn this into a habit. So then I came across this interesting uh, technique uh, from Jerry Seinfeld, and this was in a a blog, and I will uh, include that uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the show notes. Um, it was an interview that uh, this person, I think he's a software developer, his name is Brad Isaac, and the blog was in Life Hacker, where he 
at, at one time, they have these open mic nights, and he ran into Jerry Seinfeld early in, in Jerry Seinfeld's career, just right after he, I think, started his show. And, and Jerry was constantly trying to hone his skill, right? He wanted to keep on improving. He wasn't satisfied. And uh, he, before the, Jerry went on stage, Brad had a chance to have a quick word with Jerry. And, you know, Jerry was that time had his show, so he was definitely big. And he had also appeared on Johnny Carson show many times. So Jerry was, before he had his show, had been doing that for like more than a decade, I believe. And he asked him, Jerry, so can you give me a, a tip on any advice on how I can become a good comic? And what Jerry told Brad was that, uh, well, you have to write a joke every day, okay? But then he said that here's what I do. I write a joke every day, but what I also do is I call this technique that he called it the calendar system. And I said I put a, I put a big calendar in, in my uh, you know, kitchen or somewhere that you cannot miss it. And every time I write a joke, I take a red marker and put an X, a large X, so you can't miss it. And you keep doing that every day. Every, every day you write a joke, you put a big X. And then you, at, after a while, you'll start seeing a chain of Xs. But the key thing to remember is you don't want to break the chain. And that's the key tip. Do not break the chain. When you break the chain, means that after a while, you'll break it again and again and now it's not a habit and then you just cannot you know develop that skill and he said that's the technique that i've been using so when it comes to public speaking this 330 challenge after the 330 challenge you can try this cal include this calendar that jerry seinfeld used when he was developing as a comic and every day you record a three minute speech put an x large get a large calendar not a small one that everybody can see it. And it, it, maybe you can put a multiple calendar, one in the office, one at home, one everywhere, so you can't miss it. And go and keep putting the Xs. And if you miss it, then everybody's gonna see it, like, oh my God, he missed it. And you can use this for anything, public speaking, you can use it for anything that you wanna turn it into a habit. It could be getting rid of, you know, not smoking, could be exercising, could be anything. But since we are talking about speaking, you can add this as part of a, a, a tool to your 330 challenge and then continue for one year. And that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get a, a large calendar and keep putting X's uh, every time I record a speech. So that's my three minute speech segment. I hope that helps and maybe you can uh, try that. Uh, at this point, I'll go to Julie so she can give her three minute speech. Thanks, Jay. Just um, a point on that is you had given me the advice to use the phone, uh, to use the audio recorder and do a recording. I've been trying to do that again. I started, I dropped the ball, and I'm doing it again. And uh, what I'm doing is a daisy chain. So what I do is I try to listen to the one before, and then I'm going to do a new one. So hopefully um, I'll be, I won't break the chain. <laughs> I appreciate that. So, um, so as I had mentioned that I am writing um, a traveler version of a book or a booklet, a summary. Actually, it's a little workbook on 10 stretches. Um, they're very transformative stretches. And today I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the lineage or the history of it. So this, I'm going to go backwards. Um, this stretch I've been doing for 10 years on and off, and it has been really, really helpful. Um, for myself, I was at five, six years ago, I was at a stage of depression, and I couldn't do anything. And Jay knows I'm a meditator. I could not sit. I, couldn't, I could barely watch TV. The days that I was able to watch TV was um, a good day, you know. And, but one thing I was able to do was I was able to go into one of these stretches and then just uh, use it like a meditation technique and hold it for five, ten minutes. And that really helped me. Uh, I have a friend that we do it online um, on Google Hangout. We've been doing it for a year. And she has had sciatica. And she also has had a vaginal dryness. And these stretches really help her and she doesn't need to go to a doctor. 
there is these stretches. Um, you do them in what they call the yin yoga tradition, which means it's very gentle. You don't want it's not muscular at all. And the goal is to relax the connective tissues. So our body has uh, two major kinds of tissues. One is the red blood cell tissues, and that's what our muscles are made out of. But in order for the muscle to connect to the bones, there are connective tissue. They're called connective tissue tendons and ligaments. So it's a white part of the cells. In fact, every cell has connective tissue because the cell wall is white tissue. So because of the white tissue is connected to every cell in your body, when you work these connective tissues, you really work the whole body. I want to go a little bit into it that they work really well because they come from our integration of many East and West teachings. On the Western side, um, Moje Feldenkrais talks about when you change your body, you change your mind. Um, so his movements are to in, introduce a resilience and adaptability. Ida Rowe, who talks about our body, when it's aligned, it's efficient and doesn't take too much energy to move. And so in cases of illness, of trauma, the cells co collapse and then it takes a non-efficient shape. And then we lose our ability to live efficiently. And we you take a lot of energy just to stand up, for example. So either those uh, techniques help to realign the body to its most efficiency. Along the other side, there is um, the Asian side, there is a Zen master in Hawaii. His name is Tanoi. He's a martial artist. He's uh, very famous in Japan. And he's also a Zen master. He realized his Zen realizations through martial arts. And he's also a great healer. So there's a lot of energetic techniques embedded in there. Finally, um, Everett believes in that when we have emotional tension or PTSD, those, uh, those stress and memories are, re are stored in our cellular memory. And so by releasing the, by doing a cellular release through the stretches, you can change your emotional well-being and change your ability to, you can have the memory, but you don't have to feel the trauma. Um, I will talk more about that, but my goal is to basically create a worksheet uh, that you can use easily to do the stretches, the very simple yoga stretches. And the key is in the sequence. They're designed to like peel away the layers of onion. They're actually a, a meditation in movement. Um, so I would just say that I'm sure Jay will put my uh, connection, connect uh, my information for um, email address, and uh, I'm I will be happy to send anybody a beta version. Uh, thanks, Jay. <clears throat> right. So that's good. Uh, is this uh, for both male and for men and women, or it's, you're targeting? Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's for men and women. Actually, Everett is a, is a man, <laughs> Everett mm -hmm. Ogawa. He's a Japanese um, man, and he's been doing um, this kind of healing work uh, for about the last 40, 50 years. And this, um, he does body work, like uh, structural integration. And these stretches came out of his own self-practice to for self-maintenance and self-care. Right, and um, I'm sure there'll be a, a stretch for people with back problems like myself. Yes, the, the, actually there's a lot of emphasis on releasing the back. Right, right, okay, great. Okay, look forward to it. Yeah, I'm just hoping to learn more from you on that. All right, so I'm gonna take a quick pause and then we'll uh, move to our first segment where we review uh, the speech by uh, Benjamin Bratton, okay? Thank you. Uh, can you mute your line? Yes. Sorry. Here we go.
Okay, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode 32, segment number one. In this segment, we're going to review a TEDx speech that was uh, given by a professor from University of California, San Diego. I think he's a professor of philosophy and visual arts. His name is Benjamin Bratton. And uh, he gives a speech, it's roughly about, I think, 11 minutes long, where he is against TED. You know, TED Talks, he's against TED. And he gives a, a lot of uh, reasons on, on why he's against TED. Uh, so in, in this particular speech, uh, before we go into the details of what he had to say, what, what I want... Uh, if you are ever looking at a speech, uh, these are the, the questions that that I want uh, to kind of address. Uh, you know, what what did I like about the the speech? Uh, and and this, this could be, and, and of course, in this particular case, uh, we're not talking to him, so it's almost like we are giving this input, and he can take a look at it at some point when he has time, or or you can use it uh, if you're ever giving a speech. Uh, so this, that's the first question. What did I like about the speech? What could I have done to make it better? Because that's important. You don't want to give people feedback if you can't tell them how to make it better. So be careful. <laughs> when you give people feedback, you got to let them know what, what, what you would have done to make it better, not what they should have done, because that doesn't help them much. Um, then I look at uh, specifically the body language that he uses uh, throughout the speech. Uh, did it help? enhance or hurt his message because body language is very important uh the the fourth thing is the voice like does he how does he project himself with his voice because voice is like a it's your tool right that's what you use body language and voice and then of course uh the content what what was the content did i understand it and did it you know did it make sense was it understandable and the, did it make me smarter? Because I'm looking at it from the audience point of view. And then uh, the last one that we're going to talk about in the next segment is the ultimate question. And this was a persuasive speech. So the question is, was this speech persuasive? Yes or no? And that's a simple, pretty simple question. So let me start out by telling you what the speech he's trying to get across. E evidently, he has some issues with TED Talks, and he even calls it uh, uh, middle brow megachurch infotainment. So he has a point of view that he's trying to convince us that 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 TED is overrated. Okay, it's it, it's not doing what he thinks it should really be doing. So he has a definitely a point of view, and he's entitled to that. We are all entitled to our opinion. And he gives a lot of reasons. Uh, he starts by saying that, uh, that it's too simple. Uh, it's not going to change anything. It's nothing but an entertainment, right? And, and he goes on and gives all kinds of, and he even goes into the technology aspect, the, uh, the, the E aspect, he calls it the economics and uh, the design. Uh, and I, I think this this he's a professor, so he's obviously very smart and he has thought about this topic. The, the the issue that I have with the speech is, and I'll be blunt right from the beginning. Was it persuasive? No, it wasn't persuasive at all. Uh, I think the speech was geared towards I don't know who, because he had a specific audience. I don't know whether he was speaking to the audience who was present there or he's trying to reach the audience who's going to view it later. And I review a lot of speeches, and I have to be honest with you, I had a really hard time understanding this speech. It was very difficult. And I viewed this three times. Even the start of it was kind of uh, not clear. All I know is that he doesn't like Ted, but the way he, he goes on and explains it he throws a lot of these jargon at you, ecological and this and that. And I don't think he needed to do any of that. So, so the question then is, how would I make this speech better? So overall, I would say 
Did I like this speech? No. Did it work for me? No. The question I ask is that at the end of the speech, all I could say is that this guy's smart, but it doesn't make me any, it didn't make me any smarter or didn't make me persuade his point of view. In fact, he could, it had a reverse effect. It made me more like Ted than not like Ted. So the speech did not work for me. So now the question is, what would I do to make it better? Okay. I think when you are going up against something like Ted, which is, let's face it, very popular. People love Ted. And I like Ted. I, I didn't even know that there were people out there who didn't like Ted, that there was something really wrong with Ted. But I'm open to hearing about it. But if you're going to tell me that, then you've got to really realize that, that you're in a real small minority. Majority of the people like Ted. So the first thing he had to do here was he had to inject some humor right up front saying like, you know, I had to bring some security here because what I'm about to say, <laughs> I want to make sure I get out of here alive. I think it, he should have started with some kind of humor because he's basically going to knock Ted at a Ted event, okay? So he should have started with the humor. He should have shown some humor. Like he's not going to take himself seriously. The, Professor Bratton takes himself too seriously here. <laughs> he's not having fun out there. He's got this idea that Ted isn't good, and I think he's the only one who believes that. Well, evidently, that's not true. I looked at it. There are like 493,000 people who have viewed this speech, and I guess my view is in a minority. Most of the people there love this speech. They liked it. I don't know if they loved the speech or they liked his message. So it looks like there are a lot of people who don't like Ted. Uh, so I, I think if, if, if I was coaching Professor Bratton, I would say first, Professor Bratton, lighten up. Start with some humor here because you're a very small minority. You're not going to change people's mind regarding Ted. You want to make them smarter, like what Ted could do better. And he gives all sorts of reasons, but he never really gives like what he would do. What kind of like he's giving a TED talk. If this is his TED talk, let me tell you, nobody's watching this. Okay. This is type the type of talk that Ted gives. The purpose of Ted is they take a complicated message and they simplify it so that people understand it then it's up to them to do whatever they want with it. But at least that information has now been spread. What he's saying is that TED should be more like a college course, a seminar. I mean, come on, that's just not realistic. So I, I, I'm not convinced. I think his arguments are not well presented here. And he just goes off into things that I don't think many people understand. So. I think there's a lot the speech that uh, that can be done with the speech to make it more interesting. He needs to simplify it first. He talks about the first thing that he doesn't like Ted oversimplification. Well, right, that's what Ted makes that makes Ted speak so popular. They do simplify things that are very difficult for anybody, and they drop it down so many levels so that just about everybody is going to understand it. And Ted, it's not that people just take Ted and then just say, okay, this is the only, what Ted does is it allows you to explore. That's what I do. Once I watch a Ted speech, like for example, I'll give you an Amy Cuddy speech she gave. And then I went and did more research. I went and just recently purchased her book, uh, Presence, that allows me to go into the science behind that. So there's a lot that, so Ted is at the top level to kind of introduce something so that everybody can understand it. Then it's up to the individual what they want to do with it. And I don't think Professor Bratton really understands that that's what makes Ted so, 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 so popular and, uh, uh, it, and it's service. I think it's a really good service that they disseminate these, this type of message to the world and then everybody's familiar with it. And the one thing I'll point out that he said something which, uh, uh, he said he, he was at some event, and I think it was some astrophysicist who tried to pitch something, and the person said that, oh, I wish he was more like Malcolm Gladwell. And he makes some kind of a snide remark, like, Malcolm Gladwell, like, like who's he? He's a journalist. Like, you know, we're a professor. We do research. I think that was uncalled for. I don't think you'd do that. Malcolm Gladwell is a great communicator. What Malcolm Gladwell does is he reads these abstracts that people write, these journals that nobody reads in different publications. And then he takes it, simplifies it, ties it to a story so that everybody can understand it. Now, I can see that if you're a professor, you would be jealous of that because it's like, hey, why is he taking credit? 
Well, he's taking credit because he's getting to the people. That message would never get to the people if it wasn't people like Malcolm Gladwell. So I don't think he understands the value that Malcolm Gladwell adds. And let's face it, Malcolm Gladwell is a highly successful author. If he wasn't, if he wasn't doing something that people wanted to read, he wouldn't be that successful. Perhaps he can learn from Malcolm Gladwell. The same speech, Malcolm Gladwell would not have presented it like that. So anyway, at this point, I'm going to stop and let Julie to give her feedback. But I think this speech was a lost opportunity. And he could have done a lot with it. And also that it, at times I kind of felt like he was speaking to himself and didn't care whether the audience even understood what he was saying. I don't think he, he really cared. At times I, I was like kind of rooting for him. I said, break out of that, break out of that. Tell me more, tell me more so I can really be rooting for you. He just never did that. He just kept on talking the way he wanted to get his message across. And that message was muddled in my opinion. Uh, Julie, what did you think of this speech? Thanks, Jay. Yeah, um, thank you. I, first of all, I, I, I think you are a little more harsh than I am, but basically I agree. Um, I thought that he alienated the audience because he's in a, in a tech group and he's calling the middle brow. You know, that's like, uh, that's an insult. <laughs> and then he insulted Malcolm Gladwell. I, um, at first, actually, I did it the way you suggested, which is at first I look at the language, at the body language, and then I look at the content. You know, the the body language was not friendly. You know, he's basically a professor doing his speech, so it's it's in alignment with the way he del delivered the message. Um, the the message I get is that basically. Um, Ted is uh, infomercial gone wild. It pretends to be something else, but it's really not solving the problem. And Ted, he thinks, what I get is Ted thinks just having ideas and sharing ideas is world changing. And he's saying that you can't just, talking about ideas, the way Ted does it may be entertaining, but it's not effective for transformation. And then he went on to talk about different aspects of shallowness. But he talks about instead of inter the 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 Ted the T the E in the middle stands for entertainment. He said, well, why not use it for economics? And I would love to know what that means, you know. So I felt like he was just creating negative jargons and then replace it with an alternative jargon. But he never really went deep into any of it. So at the end I was, like you said, I rooted for the alternatives, but I couldn't really know what the alternative was. Um, so in terms of what would I done, what could I have done to make it better? I think that instead of having a shopping list of all these ideas, I think he could maybe just take one idea and bring it down to human experience level. You know, I think he was way up there talking about lofty ideas, but I couldn't relate to it. And I think I can understand pretty complicated ideas if it was explained to me, but it wasn't explained. It was just floating up here. So in a certain ways, I think if Ted was being entertaining, he was being supercilious. Um, I would love to hear more about his ideas because I think some of them have real value. And I would like to know what the alternative is. So I, I, I would actually would suggest that he it's better for him to take one idea and really break it down so people can relate to it, and then say here's those other ideas because then I will be hooked and I will go and find out what else he's talking about. Um, his use of body language and his use of voice was, you know, acceptable, but nothing. It's certainly, again, not emotionally connecting me to anything. Um, so I like his ideas. I would like to know more about his ideas. So that's part of the content. But he left me frustrated. It's that like he's showing me this is what you could eat, but he's not serving me the meal. So um, I, I wish he was better at it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, now that you said I'm harsh, I'm like <laughs> afraid to say anything more. So let me just be fair to Professor Bratton. Professor Bratton, you can ignore everything that we're saying here, because when I look in the YouTube, you have 493,000 views. When I record my speech, I get only four. So right away, you don't have to listen to anything I say because you know <laughs> there are 493, and most I think like only like one percent or so do not like this speech. So we are in a really a small minority, just like you are in a small minority when you say that you don't like TED. So the the other thing I would point out is um, you see the thing is I. This is the thing. This is a persuasive speech, right? So when it's a persuasive speech, there has to be some emotion behind it. And it, there were no techniques really. There were some techniques used, but I, I don't think it was done in an effective manner. Uh, I, I don't know what he used this technique. Uh, I guess it could be like a maxim, but it, I guess some people commented on this. More Copernicus, less Tony Robbins. And if you're going to say that, then put some emphasis behind it. More Copernicus, less Tony Robbins. You just can't leave it at that. There was a lot of stuff where audience had to think really hard. He was bringing stuff from all over the place that might be OK in an academic setting where people are of the same level, but not when it's a, a speech presented to people who may not be familiar. I don't think he had any respect for people who didn't know what he knew. And that's the, the, the mark of a good speaker. He assumed too much of his audience that they know who Coney was. They understood this. They understood that. Then he uses this word placebo politics and placebo this and placebo that. I think if you really want your audience to understand it, then just say placebo. What does he mean by that? Placebo politics. Never. There's no definition of that. And Yes, that would be simplifying it, and then he would feel like, oh, I'm falling into the trap. He's almost telling this that the audience has to get to his level, not that he had to get to the audience's level. And that's the part I just did not like about this speech. And that's not what a public speaking is all about. Public speaking is all about you getting to your audience's level. He can learn a lot from Donald Trump, by the way. Okay, Donald Trump would not give a speech like this. He would just say, you know, Ted, Ted is stupid. They don't even make sense. I mean. Yeah, you may not like his tone, but you'll understand what he's saying and what he's feeling. And I think he should have got taken his professor hat off and put on a Donald Trump hat and tell us exactly what he thought of Ted. Instead, he gives us a lot of stuff here that was like eating flax seeds, you know? You can't eat too much of that. It just doesn't work. I felt like I was eating breakfast, my morning breakfast with uh, oatmeal with flax seeds and uh, soy milk. You know what? It's fine for breakfast, but I don't know if I want to have that for lunch and dinner. So, Professor Bratton, please, no more flax seeds. I know you're smart, but uh, we may not be as smart as you are, and you've got to really bring it down, down to our level. So if you're ever giving a speech in the future that's you know, outside the academic setting, I think some of the things we're telling you will make you a much fantastic speaker. And one other thing is your opening has to be captivating. Use some humor, smile a little, laugh a little, and don't pace pace back and forth like that. It's distracting, even when you're watching it on video. So otherwise, you did a great job. Uh, Julie, any closing thoughts? Well, you sure injected humor into this one. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just say, Professor, uh, we're just doing this in a just we just uh, we take this very seriously and we think that there was a lot that's this speech I was like really look I was looking for a humorous speech an entertaining speech and at the same time you could have conveyed all your points and it might have been entertaining in an academic setting but it when we look at other TED speeches uh, it's not the what you believe in it's the way you communicated that that's the key thing we're trying to point out here so uh, and we could be completely wrong, but that's how we feel. So we want to be you know, fair to you. Thank you. I'm going to take a brief pause, and then we'll move to segment two. Hello. Welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 32. And this is segment number two. In this segment, we're going to talk about the ultimate question. 
So first, let me kind of explain what I mean by this. I, I recorded a video that kind of explains it, but I'll give a quick, uh, quick, quick summary. So ultimate question comes from the customer service side. And uh, Fred Reichelt wrote a book. Uh, in fact, I have it here. Here we go. Can you see it? The ultimate question. This might be the older version. And this is about uh, a question you ask somebody, whether it's uh, in, a, in, a, in a consumer space, customers, whether they would recommend a company, a product, or a service, right? That is the ultimate question. And then based on how somebody, usually it's like a 10 point, right? It's one to 10 with one being no way, hell no, I'm never going to recommend you. Nine and 10 meaning nine or 10 indicates, yes, absolutely. I'm going to be your best advocate. And that's what you want, right? Everything else like, you know, was the place clean? Were the people friendly? Was the place professional? Were, all those questions, could they're not meaningless if they're not going to recommend you because you want person to not only come back, but you want them to tell other people so they'll come back. That drives more uh, profits as you get more customers, right? They spread the word. So I took this concept and said, wait a second, this same concept could also be applied when we give a speech. Like before you give a speech, what is the ultimate question you would want to ask? Sort of like a pre-mortem, like, you know, instead of doing it at the end, just do it before and ask them, what is the ultimate question that you want to know? Forget about like, you know, was your body language good? Were you projecting yourself? Did you look confident? All the thing is fine for you, but that's not the ultimate question. The ultimate question is, depending on what kind of speech you're giving, whether it's intro, whether it's uh, impromptu, in, informative, or persuasive. So, so let's take a look at, uh, if it's an informative speech, did you make the audience, did, did the speaker make you smarter, right? That would be the ultimate question. And if they say yes, forget about all, anything else they put down. You succeeded. Let's say if it was a persuasive speech, the ultimate question in my opinion is, was the speech persuasive, yes or no? That's all you want to know. You don't care about whether the stock issues were good and all that, that's all details. At the end, that doesn't mean anything. If they agree that your speech was persuasive, you succeeded. Uh, similarly, intro, is that person memorable or not memorable? You could introduce yourself, hi, I'm Jayosa, and I coach uh, speaking, and I do this and that. And then they're meeting other people, and at the end, they're like, yeah, that intro wasn't that memorable. I failed. Simple as that. Same thing with impromptu, right? You know, was the impromptu convincing, not convincing? I don't know what the ultimate question is, but what I'm trying to point to is, that you need to come up with that ultimate question before you give any speech, whether it's an intro, whether it's an informative, impromptu, or persuasive. And this could happen in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, could happen in a small group, or it can happen in a large audience. Nail that ultimate question before you give a speech. Julie, what do you think of this? And what is the ultimate question you have for all four speeches? You're still muted, Julie. Thanks, Jay. I, I don't have an ultimate question. I know we've talked about this several times. I, I like to say, like, for the informative speech, did I get smarter? Did I learn something? And I think for the persuasive speeches, am I changing? Am I changing my attitude? Am I changing my behavior? And I like uh, what you added um, today, which is uh, in the introduction speech, am I memorable? Can I can I be remembered? Um, I think um, that is actually very interesting because, as you know, before we started the speech, we talked about what's your what's your one sentence, your one sentence that brands you or tells people who you are. And we came up for you was um, when you sp I am how I speak or I am the I am what I speak. Um, I thought that was very effective for what, what you're doing with the coaching process. It underscores a lot of things in a single sentence. Um, I I think my 
I guess getting down to the bottom line, my ultimate question was, what was my goal, and I did, I, did I reach my goal? You know, um, I also thought the way you did the presentation, you seem very relaxed, and you seem more relaxed than um, in previous speeches you have done. So that was very nice to see, and I thought that your hand gestures were good, um, like that. And that's about all I have for the ultimate question. I think that I think that what you said right now is also also interesting. That is a pre-mortem, you know. Maybe in a worksheet, we want to say what's the ultimate question or the ultimate goal. So when we're done with the speech, we can say, did we reach my goal or not? I think that's a very effective way to uh, create a speech. So that's a nice tool. Thank you. Yeah, the, the one thing I, I want to make it clear is the ultimate question is not it's not the question you're asking. It's the question you want the audience to be. It's the question you want the audience to answer, right? That's the ultimate question. So I just want to make it clear because this is not a question you're asking yourself. This is the question you want the audience to answer before you give a speech. So that's the pre-mortem part of it. So for example, uh, like I said, if I was doing an intro, the question, let's say if, after I did the intro, somebody went to the audience and said, hey, can you fill out this little form? And the question would be the ultimate question, was Jay Oza memorable, yes or no? That's the ultimate question right there. And let's say if I was giving a per informative speech, afterwards I give it, the ultimate question I want them to answer is, did Jay Oza make you smarter with what he talked about, something like that. That would be my ultimate question. And similarly with persuasive, this is my ultimate question. Everybody has to come up with their ultimate question first before they give a speech. So again, the point here is, this is the question you want the audience to answer after you give a speech, but we're bringing it into the front, so that becomes a pre-mortem. So any closing thoughts, Julie? Yes, when I said the goal, basically I'm saying, uh, that's the ultimate question I want my audience to answer. Uh, that's what I meant when I said the goal of the speech. So if my goal, if my speech is to to tell people to do something, the ultimate question for for me is, are you going to do it? And so the way I will frame it is, my goal is for the audience to do it. So that I'm. I'm reverse engineering it into what my goals are as I reach for that question. As I, as I try to imagine what the ultimate question answered by the audience. Does that make sense? Yeah, so let me put you on a spot. So next week uh, you're going to facilitate a session on reading poetry to become a better speaker. So yes. what, what is the ultimate question? So assume you did that speech right now. And now you're saying, okay, I'm going to do a quick survey to see how I did. So what is the ultimate question you want me to answer? Well, I have two questions. The first one is, are you going to, are you going to read some poems? No, no, I just want one. There can only be one. Oh, ultimate okay. Question. Uh, will you read some poems? Because it's a persuasive speech. So, so that's your ultimate question. That uh, after, yeah. listening, after listening, so this is the ultimate question that I would get. Now that after listening to Julie Finkelstein's uh, segment on reading poems, does this make you more likely to you know, follow this technique? Yes or no? That's the question? Yes. OK. So that's the question you want to write it down. And that's the question yes. you want to write it down before you give your speech, that that's what I'm trying to hit for. So that you're, right. now you have a focus, that that's the question. You've got to get a yes on that. Because uh, so that means that you got to give me everything so that at the end I say yes. You know, she's convinced me that I need to try this technique. It's something I need to take a look at. So I just yes. this is sort of re real time. We're kind of uh, uh, brainstorming on how this would work. So I just wanted to kind of say this was the pre mortem since you're giving this next week. Next week, so this is the pre mortem that you would go through. So that's the yeah. question that I would write down. Okay. At this point, I think anything else. So I think uh, that's great. Okay. So I'll take a break. Pause. <laughs> And then, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 32. My name is Jay Yosa, and this is uh, segment number three. 
Now, I had recorded a video, and I gave it a really provocative title, Why Persuasive Speeches Suck. OK, I apologize if you're offended, but there was a reason for that. I review a lot of persuasive speeches, uh, both uh, on the Coursera platform. A lot of students uh, you know, record their persuasive speeches, and also TED Talks and others. In fact, we just reviewed a, a persuasive, persuasive speech by Professor Benjamin Bratton from University of California, San Diego. And most of these persuasive speeches are not that persuasive. And I was like thinking, why is that the case? What's going on here? And I think one of the things I think that I, I see as a reason that they're not persuasive is there's not that emotional uh, uh, emotional persuasion in these speech. There's no emotional feeling. Emotional feeling is very important uh, in, in persuasive speeches. So the question is, what gives you that? First of all, you have to be you have to believe in what you're saying. Okay, you got to believe it. But it's not whether you believe it. You got to convince the audience. And the way to con convince the audience is using the stylistic techniques that uh, great speakers use. It could be using a maxim, could be using an anaphora. Uh, I mean, the alliteration. I mean, there are all these techniques that that are available at at your disposal that you have to use. But before you try to convince somebody and write your speech, you need to do this first. If somebody asks you, like, what are you ticked off at? Like, you know, what do you, what ticks you off about the presidential election? What ticks you off about football? What ticks you off about? You should be able to describe that in one of those uh, uh, stylistic techniques before you go into the details of it. So if somebody says, what do you don't like about football? I have to say, I hate football because of this. I hate football because of uh, it, the games are too long. I hate football because there are too many commercials. I hate football because... Uh, the, the games are just, you know, not close. Now I have an anaphora right there. Now I can take that and turn it into a speech. So first, I ask yourself, what are you so ticked off about? What are you trying to persuade? Can you capture that in some sort of a stylistic technique? And then you can move next to the, the, the stock issues that uh, uh, Professor McGarrity talks about in his course, Introduction to Public Speaking, the, the, you know, the ill, you know, what's the problem? Uh, the blame, you know, what's what's the cause of the, the problem? Um, the cure, what's the solution? And, and what are the consequences of fixing it? And then the call to action, right? So those are the stock issues, the ills, the blames, the cures, the consequences, and the call to action. Now, in the course, I think the reason why very few people, in fact, I haven't found a single student who have ever used any of these stylistic techniques effectively, because when I usually give a grade, I have never given anybody even a good. Most of them are below adequate. And I had to be so hard on them. But that is the fundamental part of a persuasive speech, especially for this uh, course that many people take. And, uh, and, and I think what happens is that the course is really an excellent course. But I think the way it's, and I think Professor McGarrity tells many times that these techniques are very important, uh, but some of the students are not getting it. And I think the reason is that the course starts out by going into persuasive speech by looking at the stock issues. And when he gets to the stylistic techniques in lect a video lecture week nine, he, he uses these examples of famous speakers like Malcolm X, Bill Clinton, Winston Churchill, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy, you name it. and I think what people think is like those techniques are for great speeches. And I think that's not the way you want to look at it. Those are techniques you should be using in everyday persuasion uh, any time you're giving a persuasive speech, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, in a small group, or in front of a large audience. So these techniques are not for the great speakers. They're for everybody, for all speakers. And so the, the technique, what I'm telling people is if they're taking this course, that before you even get to the week seven, week eight, go right to the stylistic technique and understand them thoroughly. Then come up with it. Like, what is something that's ticking you off? And use one of those techniques to describe the problem using the stylistic technique. And then you can work on the, on the, the stock issues. And I think if you do that, your speech is going to be persuasive and quite powerful. So that's what I do.
and I gave an example in my video. I did that recently for a, a meeting that I had in school related to some issue that had come up uh, with my son's uh, son being in the marching band and awarding varsity letter. And I essentially did exactly what I'm telling you. I found out what the stylistic technique I wanted to use, and I used uh, two of them, Maxim and an Anaphora. And then it allowed me to really think of exactly what exactly what I'm, what I'm trying to persuade. And it worked because they eventually decided that they did not want to do that. They wanted to award varsity letter to anybody who was in the marching band. So try that and let me know what you think. Uh, Julie, what, what do you think of, uh, of like, how do you make a speech persuasive? And uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, Jerry, thank you. This is a very uh, important topic. And I can share with you that um, it's a mental burnout. You know, as you say that the course is excellent, but there is so much to it. I think most of us um, just can't absorb the, all that information in one week. In the sense that in, um, in a knowledge-based class, you would just learn the facts and memorize it. But this is a practice-oriented class. So each of those techniques probably take, you know, uh, a week just to practice to get the idea of it before we can even integrate it into our speech. Um, but your your point is very well taken. Is until you can have some kind of connection with your audience, you you don't really have an effective speech. And these techniques that are shown, alliteration, anaphora, ephora, um, they're all tools to help us to become more dramatic, more emotionally expressive, uh, which connects to my uh, speech next week. Um, in my speech, I have used a very simple repetition. So for every new idea, I have a very succinct sentence. So for example, I say practicing reading poems is effective because poems are short. Poems are short is an advantage because you can repeat the poem many times. Poems are dramatic. Poems are dramatic because they contain many emotional and vocal variety and they also have many devices such as alliteration, onomatopoeia. Practicing with dramatic pieces help us to have greater dramatic expression. So that's the technique I use. I use this, a simple sentence and I repeat it at the beginning of the paragraph to un underscore and organize my ideas. So I, I actually just used it this time and I found it very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I think, <clears throat> so, so here's the thing. Uh, if you're giving a persuasive speech, take risk and do it. I mean, especially, especially for a course. So I think somehow people are fearful of using these techniques for whatever reason. Maybe they don't think they need it. Maybe they think that they can't pull it off. Maybe they think that they're not good enough speakers to use it. That these are only tools for, you know, good, great speakers. And my point is that you got to use it now because these are not these are not things that are for great speakers the great speakers are great because they know how to use this plus they have a content uh, and I give you know examples uh, in my video there that Reagan's uh, this is what people are going to remember your speech so you can't ignore this right I mean if you just listen to the, the speech uh, from Benjamin Bratton about him not liking Ted but there wasn't any maxim about that you could take away. I mean, the only one I got was, you know, the, uh, the, something about Copernicus and less uh, Tony Robbins. Okay, but he could have said that right in the beginning, right in the beginning and saying, okay, this talk is gonna try to convince you that, the, 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 and in fact, I'll get you the exact line, uh, more Copernicus, less Tony Robbins. Less, more Copernicus, less Tony Robbins. And then he could have gone and said, what do I mean by that? I'm just saying that's just, a, uh, we had a whole segment on that, so you can take a look at. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is, um, let me point to the speech uh, by Bill Clinton, uh, the 2012 nominating speech that he gives at the Democratic National Convention. 
And Bill Clinton is a great speaker by any measurement. And what he does in the beginning, he starts with an anaphora, like, you know, I'm here to nominate a man. I'm looking you know, something that I want a man. That's his thing. That's his anaphora. I want a man. And he goes on to describe all of Obama's accomplishment. And then he does something that only Bill Clinton can do and pull it off. And this is something that when you watch it, it goes by quickly. But this is what makes him a really such a powerful speaker. The last, typically three is what you you pretty much want to stop after three because then it gets repetitive and it loses its impact. But Bill Clinton does something very clever. On the last one, when he says, I want a man, and he says, this is what he does. You've got to watch it, and I'll provide the link. I want a man who had the good sense of marrying Michelle Obama. I call that the anaphora plus, because that has nothing to do with his overall presidential achievement, but it's his personal achievement, right? And if you're ever giving a speech, that's always available to you. Any event you go to, whether it's like uh, you're speaking at a wedding, you're speaking at a, 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 at a corporate event, you're speaking at any event, that plus part is always there. Use it, because what that does is, if you use it in the beginning, it makes you very likable. And once people like you, then the next part is they have to trust you. And if, if you've been introduced well, if somebody's introduced you and established your credibility, then the trust factor you get with it. But a lot of speakers don't realize the importance of likability. And the likability has to happen in the beginning. You can't suddenly become likable at the end. That's too late. People start tuning out. So uh, a lot of these techniques, they kind of, it's a little advanced, actually, if you're looking, if you're like still going through the course, but they all kind of work together. And, you know, you can kind of go crazy, like, what do I do? What do I do? And when people are taking the course, and I think what Julie said is absolutely correct, it can get quite overwhelming. That's why I say that this course is not that easy. You can kind of sleepwalk you through this course and not learn anything because that's what this is. There's a lot of there. You can just do a speech. And, and the thing what happens with persuasive speeches, if you don't add these techniques and you don't make it really powerful with your emotion, then it essentially you're turning your persuasive speech into an informative speech. And an informative speech may inform people, but it's not persuading them. So it's a fail. You can have all the great points, but if you're not persuading them that there is no, uh, that they, they don't want to spread the message or they don't want to take action or they, they're not even persuaded, then the speech was a waste of time. So you really do need to understand this. Otherwise, every time you're giving a persuasive speech, you're just not going to be effective. So Julie, any, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I, thank you so much. Um, it occurs to me that when I gave my first informative speech, uh, a fellow mentor, Somian, said it, it sounded like a, the first time I gave an informative speech, he said it sounded like a persuasive speech. And the first time I put a persuasive speech in a video, he said it sounded like an informative speech. <laughs> so I think I've created a hybrid. Uh, which is fine, but in the end, I think um, it's really good to develop those persuasive skills, whether someone's doing informative speech or persuasive speech. Because it, the, 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 the persuasive truths, as you mentioned, they, they make you uh, connectable, approachable, and then when they like you and they trust you, then they can buy your message, but not before that. So yeah, uh, I, I think we need to go through each of those techniques, maybe one a week, and then uh, really demonstrate how, all, how we can use it in ordinary speech, you know? Or at least pick one of your favorites or one of my favorites and do that. Yeah, I think that's, a, <clears throat> that's an excellent suggestion, Julie. I think what we, whoever, uh, that's a good suggestion, and I think we could like take one each, which one you're comfortable with. And what we can do is uh, use the one that somebody famous has used, and then you can say, here's what I would do. Here's how, here's how I've used it, similar technique in my situation. So you're kind of showing, like, let's say, if it's uh, Obama or Malcolm X or, or, or somebody 
Reagan, like he uses a maxim, and then show, oh, see, here's how Reagan did it in his famous speech. But you know what? We also can do it in a speech where we're having with one-on-one -on -one with somebody or in a school setting, uh, any kind of small meeting at work, and here's how I used it. So that way, people will understand that, hey, these techniques are available for all of us, not just for, 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 for great speakers. And uh, yeah. the, other thing you, the other thing you can do is that now that uh, you're getting that comment, you can just swap your speeches, and then that solves the problem. <laughs> you know what? I think um, we can explore that at the end of the meeting, which is your <laughs> new technique. <laughs> right. All right. So at this point, uh, unless you have any questions, or any comments about the show, we can wrap it up, and then uh, we'll come back and uh, get into our miscellaneous talk, which we normally don't include in our uh, when we post it, it's just something we talk about the random topics related to next week, etc. So, anything else before I wrap this uh, this show? Okay. So, thank you all for watching. And uh, if you have uh, any questions, comments, or suggestions on how we can make this better, we certainly welcome your criticism. But all I ask you is, if you're going to criticize it, then tell us how we can make it better. Because without that, it doesn't really help us much, right? So we welcome any kind of criticism, and uh, but we want to get better. So uh, criticize, but also make us better, and we'd appreciate that. So at this point, I'll close this out, and we'll see you next week when we do our the next episode 33. Okay, so now we get to the miscellaneous talk. So we got quite a bit of time so let's see uh, so so I think that the idea that you have about the stylistic technique I'm going to jot that down because that is something that I, I like that idea so I yeah technique. because then we can post it as a little hint you know uh, into the section um, and I think it's a good idea because I don't know all of them and I don't use all of them so it'll be an opportunity for me to really spend some time understanding them and also try to teach other because, like I say, the best way to 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 learn something is by teaching. So I think yeah. if you can pick, so pick the ones that you like, and you can then do a. Uh, well, so this is I'm, something you can start thinking about. It doesn't mean you have to do yeah. it next week. So write down some of the techniques you want to work on, and you can then, whenever you have time, you can record it, and then we can include it in in, in our program to fill it in. Yeah, you know, I think. We could have like sequential themes, since we have. Um, I thought that we can do this theme maybe for even a few months, and it's make it almost um, the same idea on introduction speeches, um, because you're working on something on introductory video, and Marius is doing one, um, and I I'll do one too. I thought that since there's so much energy there that we can talk about, like all the things you talked about, I took notes. Um, I think that would be like a practical theme and a, and a use, and a, a practical theme and a public speaking theme, which is like what we said is there should be like a, is a, you know, first thing could be like a, is an elevator speech or elevator conversation. Another speech could be, um, you know, that's like the short speech. Like, like how many different kind of speeches, and how do you, how do you create a pro a product? Just like I was saying, the um, in written, there's like a short bio. Well, actually, in written, there's like a little tag on a business card, right? That would be your one sentence idea, and then there may be like a two paragraph bio um, that I put. In, uh, in your client info pack, right? And then there's a CV. So there's, there's levels of information, but you want to make sure it's like a consistent product. And that we, need, we want something similar in a verbal. You know, we want to have a pithy one sentence or right. introduction. And then, and then you want to have a longer introduction. Like if I, if I was making a sales call, I might want a little bigger, longer introduction, and then and then uh, networking event. There might be a different kind of introduction, and then finally, like we said, if we're giving a public speak, so there may be like four or five different kind of intros, 
and how they are linked together. I think that could really help someone developing a business. <clears throat> right, right. I think you did you did something like that. Uh, in, I think one of the, I think I heard you in one of the speeches. Uh, and uh, the one thing I, 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 I recommend people is that uh, the way you introduce it, because remember, if my motto is you are how you speak, then you better speak well because people are going to judge you immediately and you don't have a lot of time to create a good first impression. So like for, let's say since Marius, exactly. is, not, since Marius yeah. is not here. So let's say, so let's say you're married. I'm going to make you Marius since you talk to him quite a bit, right? Yes. I want you to, so let's say I meet you and saying, hi, my name is Jayoza. Let's say at some event and I come and say, hey, uh, hi, my name is Jayoza. I, uh, I help people uh, become uh, confident speakers or something like that. Let's say I just say that, okay? I, I, I haven't prepared. I say, oh, I, or I can say, let's say I give you a professional style. Okay, so this is the first one I say, oh, hi, uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jayoza. I'm a speech coach, okay? So that's my first introduction, okay? But now you're Marius and you've been trained, you come on this show and we've coached you that that's, don't introduce the way I just introduced myself where I said, hi, I'm Jay Oza and I'm a speech coach. That's not the way you want to introduce yourself. So now you're Marius and you say, oh, I'm Marius. How are you going to introduce yourself to me? Oh, you want to role play now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just something oh, cool, quick cool. that comes yeah, to mind. Sure. Hi, I'm Marius. I know I help... Um, I help people to understand the problems and develop new solutions in um, the legal environment and also looking for trade opportunities between Europe and Asia. Okay, that's too long. It's got to be very, it's got to be like no more than three, three or four words. So you help, okay, the first you started out well, I help, I help what? You got to help. You remember when I'm asking you that you have to solve a problem that I might be having, right? So I help people succeed or something like that. I help people. To me, help, that's too generic. But it is. But then that's why you have to get me curious. Like, what does that mean? So, so how do you do that? That's you have to get me to ask that. So, so that's pretty broad. So how do you do that? Because if it's not too, if something is not too, like I say, if I said this to you, uh, so like I said, I could also ask you the questions like, you know, do you know anybody out there? But I think that's a little corny. You got to be careful not to be that. Thing. But if it's something quick, I say, oh, I help people give uh, succeed giving high stakes speeches like that. Right. Right. Now, that's general. Right. That's pretty general. So at this point, you're going to say if you're in see, if I don't want to tell you more if you have no interest. Okay, <laughs> That's the thing. Introduction is if I'm not making an impact in that first sentence, then why am I telling you all this other stuff that is of no interest to you? You okay. may not be the you may not be the right person for that. Okay. How about this? I help people. I help people um, grow their business. I don't know. I help businesses with opportunities and problems. No, no, no. That's the, too long. Too long. It's got to be something very simple and direct. I help people. I help business succeed like that. And that's fine. That's yours. That's your narrative. You can't tell me that that's too general. That's yours. If that's mine, then you got to ask, you got to draw me in because I don't want to tell you more unless you show some interest in me. Why am I telling you things like, hey, Julie, um, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jayoza. I do, I, I enjoy speaking. I mentor on Coursera. I do this, da 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 da. And you're like, but wait a second. Why are you telling me all this? I have no interest in this, okay, right? Okay, but if, if I say, okay, so just like, this is a real concern. If I tell you I help people succeed, you could say, well, don't we all? And then. Well, that's okay. No, 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 but not I help people succeed. It has to have, like, I help business business people uh, or, or, like, a business executive or something. It, it has to be something where the guy says, wow, this guy is under, he may understand my problem because I may want to know more about it because perhaps he can do that for me. So if you say, Oh, I help, uh, or let's say if you're a real estate agent, I help people find their dream home, dream house, mm -hmm. right? That's a real estate rather than saying, oh, I'm a real estate agent. I help people find their dream house or something like that. Or I help people uh, succeed in business like that, right? That's pretty simple because then you say, oh, really? Oh, how do you do that? That's the question. See, if, you're if you make a blanket statement like that, that I help people, or if you can, in your case, you can say, I help people relieve stress, something like that, right? So, so, oh, Julie, how do you do that? 
and then you can go in. Then they, you, they've just given you permission to go for 30 seconds and explain more. So you okay, see the I, initial. Yeah. Okay. So how does this sound? I help people go. I go help people go beyond stress. No, no, simple. I help people relieve stress. Well, I don't do that. Okay, so what do you do? <laughs> no, no, tell me. Don't give me too much. Just tell me simply what do you do if, if you only have like five, five words. I help people and then only two more words after that. You make people happy? Do you make people uh, peaceful? Do you make people relieve stress? Do you make people... Uh, I help people. Because you gotta, you gotta nail that. Otherwise, every time you speak, if you cannot nail that, then you already lost them. I don't know. I help people realize themselves. Okay. Okay. So then the next question I said, oh, so uh, how how do you how do you make them realize? See, the whole point is you want to draw them in. Say something where they say, you know, I help people feel good about themselves. You know, something like that, and they'll say, "Oh, really? How, like, because uh, remember, uh, who was that? Somebody was it? Steve Jobs or somebody used to put down like who was that guy? Uh, that Google guy who puts down his card that he's what? That oh, right, Chain Man Ten. Yeah, yeah, he has a unique title on his uh, business right. card. He puts something down. He's a like a right. something. Well, what does he put down? Uh, was it? He's the funniest guy in. He is. Yeah, he has something very funny, and that's what yeah. you need. Yeah, uh, 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 Mr. Like, what is that? He, he calls He's a, the jolly good fellow. There you go. That, that, so, so, you ask fellow. him, so what, what do you do? I'm a jolly good fellow. If you looked at his card and he said, jolly good fellow, oh, what, is, what does that mean? What does that mean, jolly? I've never seen that title. So you need to get somebody to ask you a question. That That whole thing is not about you it's about the audience seeing something in you it's to describe what you do with the audience if you say i'm a speech coach no okay well, he's a speech coach it makes me look like i'm some sort of a, a corporatist like but you have to solve problems so jolly good fellow is solving a problem right that he brings he makes people happy jolly good fellow right if somebody's a jolly good fellow he's making people happy uh, and you can understand that remember the, the title is not whatever you say i help people it's not about what you do it's about how you can help them Okay, how about this? I connect the dots between vision and action. It's, it's, that, that gets a little too, too esoteric. Too, it's too, no, you got to be very simple so that even a, even a, like a second grader can understand it. Like, oh, I make people happy. Oh, everybody can understand that, right? It's got to be like, it's like a jolly good fellow. That's a very simple thing, right? He's a jolly good fellow. He's a jolly good fellow. Everybody knows that. That's pretty clever, by the way. If there's one thing you can learn from that, it's just that his title. That you got to describe a title that exactly has the effect on people. So here's the question, Julie: What kind of effect people will have, uh, whatever you do? That's what you want. So like, if I'm going to make somebody succeed in speaking at the end, right? At the end, they achieve, they succeed. Then that is what I do, not what I think I'm doing. It's the result. What is the result you're generating? That's what okay. Really I do. help people act on their dreams. There you go. That's good. Yeah, I like that. You yeah. Do? Yeah. No. Yeah. Because then. Okay. So. 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 Now. Look at the end. If somebody works with you, is that what they would say? That Julie helped me act on my dreams. And if that's what they're saying, then that's what your title. That's what you describe yourself as. That you know. I'll tell you what people tell me. You just say I act on my dreams, and it's the reason I tell you that. Somebody said, "What does that mean?" That's what people tell me. That's what I do. But they ask him like, well, "Julie, what do you do?" They tell me that I help them act on their dreams. And a lot of times they need someone like me to work with. Because a lot of, they don't feel that they have the confidence to do it themselves. That they need a coach like me to to help them uh, uh, act on their dreams. So, so what, okay. what I'm what I'm saying is that if you want to tell people what you're what you really do, you have to look at the end result. What is the result you're generating, and then that's what you do, not what you think you're doing. Like I can't tell people I teach speaking, I teach public speaking. That's what I think I'm doing. That's not what some the result I'm generating could be. I help people succeed, and that could be like, how do you do that? I do it through speaking. So that's what I'm essentially doing, right? And that's why I was saying that. That's what uh, that. So that's Jerry, you, what you did is amazing. Did you get that for yourself? Like no. what you just did is amazing. No. Okay, 
you just help me brand myself, right? Yeah. That is, most people don't get that. So that's like, I just want to mirror back to you. That is something that's very, very valuable to people. You did it very naturally. You did it very fluidly. And you enjoyed it because there was a lot of energy. Right. So what is your brand? My brand is I help people act on their dreams. Okay. Keep repeating that. So repeat it three times. I help people act on Act on their dreams. I help people act on their dreams. No, no, no. Dreams. You believe it. You got to believe it. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm making sense. Okay. No, no. You got to because see, the reason is if you can't say it, means you're not doing it. You can't do it. So you got to say, oh, Julie, if I wake you up in the middle of the night and saying, Julie, if I call you, like, see, I have your number, right? Julie, what do you do? I help people act out their dreams. <laughs> because see, if you don't believe it, then why would I believe it? So you got to, like, say, Oh, I, I, I know it sounds kind of corny. Hi, I'm Julie Finkelstein. So I say, hey, I'm Jay Oza. I'm a speech. So let's say, so let's do that. So now I'm going to meet you. Okay. So we're at an event. Okay, cool, cool, cool. We're at an event and I'm going to come to you and say, okay, so I'm going to come to you and say, oh, uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jay Oza and I'm a speech coach. Okay. I look like nervous guy. Okay. So I haven't, I haven't been trained by me. So here I am. Uh, allow me to introduce. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, your name is Julie. Julie, my name is Jay Oza, and I uh, am a speech coach. What do you do? Or, or like, that's it. I'm not going to say what do you do. You At this point, I'm giving the baton to you, so you take it and you introduce yourself. Oh, hi, Jay. Nice to meet you. Um, I help people act out their dreams. And actually, speech can maybe, uh, you know, is a very important part of that. Okay. So... So the thing is, okay, so, so you got that. So the thing is this, say, oh, uh, oh, Jay, nice to meet you. I do, what I do is very simple. I act, I help people act on their dreams. And then say, oh, really, what, what does that mean? So then that's the thing. So now you just, got, see, the thing is, you just got me to ask you to tell me more about that. So what, so Julie, what does that mean? So. So how do you do that? Like, what does that mean? You act on their dreams. So now I've given you 30 second permission to go into specifically what you do. And here you have to give me some specific example on how you have helped somebody reach their dreams. So say, okay, so now this is the 30 second you get. I've just given you a 30 second per time. You just got a 30 second. And this is where your elevator speech comes in. This is where your elevator speech could come in, where you say, okay, so whatever that is so you know a lot of people out there essentially want to do a lot but they just don't think they can do it and I coach them and kind of help them understand what they're really capable of and to give you an example I help this person named uh, Marius and Marius wants to be a coach and now Marius is ready to start his own practice and I'm helping him act his dream so you have to end it with that so anyway, I just made That's that very up. Nice. <laughs> I just made that That's up. So, very so, nice. so, 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 so you start out by saying, "Oh, so here's how. So here's what I do." There are a lot of people. There has to be a specific example. So I'll give you the. So you start by saying there are a lot of people out there who just have dreams, but they just don't have somebody who can help them achieve it. I help them achieve it, and I'll give you. I'm currently working with a client who wants to start his own coaching practice. And now, after working with him, he's ready to launch it. I help people act on their dreams. That's it. Oh, Julie, wow. I, I like that. I want to know more. You know, we, can, we, can we chat? And So at this point, you don't go. So here's another thing. So let's say this happened, OK? And the person wants to know more. At this point, you don't want to say more. You say, you know what we should do? We should schedule a, a, a session where we can, I can spend time with you for half an hour. And after that, if you want to work with me, we can then discuss uh, how we can do that. So at that point, you're done. You, you, at that point, you already told everything he's interested. But now, don't use that time to tell him more because you're not trying to solve his problem while he's there. Okay, That's a mistake that we all tend to make. That's not what you're there for. You're not there to provide free consulting. You, if this is really interested, you're willing to spend 30 minutes. And it could lead to a friendship. He may not become your client. But at least you'll have a friendship and he may recommend mm -hmm. you to somebody else. So after you do that, you've given your 30 seconds. Do not go into too many details and say, you know, this I work with him and knowing it. But here's what I do. If you're interested, 
so if you're interested, I can put you on the calendar and, you know, we can talk for 30 minutes and after you can experience it. That's what you want to tell them. If you want to experience it, I give out, you know, I can do, we can do a free 30 minute session. Doesn't, and after that, if you want to work with me, then we can discuss uh, the financial terms like that. So that's how you want to, uh, that's how I would like to do it. I'm not sure I'm there yet, but that's how I would like to do it. Like if somebody says, oh, I like to be a good speaker. What do you suggest I do? What are some of the tips? And I said, you know, if you really want to be, because a lot of people are not serious, by the way, you know that, right? And you say, listen, right. if you really, here's what I would say. So let's say you, you come to me and say, okay, so let's say, so now you're going to do that. So you're going to come to me and, uh, and, and meet with me. So, okay, go ahead. You want me to ask? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just myself. so you just saw okay. me and you saw my name tag, Jay. Oh, Jay. Oh, I see. You're uh, you help people, and it says on it. You have a drink in your hand, so just pretend you got a, like a like a little cocktail. <laughs> oh, I see. So you help people uh, uh, succeed, giving high stakes, something like that, right? So something with high stakes. So what is oh, that? Oh, hi, Jay. How are you? I see that you give you help people with high stakes pictures. What does that mean? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Julie. Nice to meet you. Yeah, what it means is that uh, people have to give high stakes speeches, means whether they're going to win something or lose something, right? And uh, I help them whether it's uh, maybe it could be as simple as a conversation, could be a job interview, could be a speech uh, at work. Or could be a speech in front of a large audience and uh, my job is to get them ready so that uh, they win because they may not get a second chance and it could you know uh, it could set them back uh, for a short time or forever so each high stakes speeches have to be pursued like uh, you know uh, a, a speech where you have to really win oh that's interesting like who have you helped right so I've I've helped in uh, all different kinds of situation. It all depends because I, that's why I keep the word high stakes uh, very general because high stakes is not defined by me. It's really defined by you. It could be a simple, uh, like, let's say you're going for a job interview. Most people think of job interviews like answering questions. And I tell them that's not how you should view a job interview. You should view, view that as a high stakes uh, meeting and uh, prepare somebody adequately. To be honest with you, Julie, a lot of times people know they can do it, but unless they get a coach, they don't think they can execute. So my job is to help them generate results that they're looking for. And by working with them, and you know, if, if you ever are interested in this, if you ever have a high stakes, let me know. And what I offer is that you can record a three minute video and I'll give you a feedback. And if you're interested uh, based on that, then we can do a 30 minute session and I can go into more detail. And then if you're interested after that, uh, you know, we can then talk about how we can work uh, beyond that. So rather than me telling you, I'll, the thing I'd like to offer to you is that I'll, you can actually experience it. So if you have a high stakes speech that you're planning to give in the next uh, week or month or so, just let me know and I'll be happy to work with you and uh, help you win. Can I get your feedback on that? Yeah, sure, sure. So just uh, let me know when, when, do, because the other thing is that uh, if you're not giving a high stakes speech, then it doesn't mean it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not going to help you because I deal with, uh, I actually mentor a course and I help people uh, with their public speeches. But what I found is the only way to really learn public speaking is when there's something at stakes and high stakes mm. is the best way to learn because that's when you're going to be really attuned. You're going to listen to a quote. And what I do is I have to make you wing. So if you have a, let's say, a, a conversation that you want to have with your executive, I mean, just to give you an example, my daughter has a meeting with her vice president. And for her, that's I told her, I said, uh, you've got to view that as a high stakes. How are you going to prepare for it? You're only going to get one chance. Your vice presidents don't take out time out to meet with you for lunch that often. That becomes a high stakes meeting. Does that mean that you're going to get promoted in that meeting? No, it positions you. So every single interaction kind of becomes a high stakes. And if you're not, if you don't have a coach, now every time you can't get a coach, but some people do, right? Executives have coaches. So every time you have to ask yourself, is this a speech that can either enhance your career or hurt your career? And if it's going to help you enhance your career, then you should get a coach because just having that 
somebody work with you can make a big difference. And typically what people do is uh, they wing it. Well, or, isn't that interesting? I never thought of that. Is it very expensive to hire you? Uh, I don't it, have that much money. Yes, it is expensive <laughs> because uh, I'm very good at what I do. <laughs> so uh -huh. I, I, I mean, I typically uh, what I tell people is that. So, so Julie, here's the thing. I, I understand. I understand. That, you know, some people don't have the money. They're in early stage in their in their in their career, and uh, if you send me uh, information, I can point you to several videos that I have done, and I've done it specifically for that. Because a lot of people, if they don't have the money, I refer them to the videos that I have done. That can help you a lot. And here's my suggestion. No matter what you do, <laughs> if you just record yourself, that alone is going to make you twice as better than not doing it. So that's my number one tip, that just record your video and see if you are in the person's shoes, would you, do you like what you just said? And if you like it, then that's fine. For many people, if you just do that much, then you're already going to be twice as better than before. But if you really are in a competitive situation, and that's why I always tell it, but high stakes means that it's a win or loss, right? Because if it's not high stakes, then it doesn't matter. So when you say you don't have money, the, the question is not whether you have money. The question is, are you ready to make the investment? And I don't want to sound like somebody who's just trying to just, uh, because it's a result. And if you're not happy with the result, then you know what? I'll give you your money back because my job is to deliver results. So money is not the way you should look at this. The question is, is this an investment worth making? And that's what I do. That's how I, I, I tell people that if you're looking at the money, then perhaps the speech is not that high stakes. Okay, stop. It's 11.30. <laughs> 11 okay. oh, that, that was really fun. I think we need to do more. More of that kind of stuff. Yeah, right, 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 right. Because the, because that's part of the coaching, right? That role playing. And a right. lot of times, because this now tell, I'm gonna go and view it and seeing if this was a real scenario. What could I have done better? How do I need to tweak it? Because these are kind of situ situations that are gonna occur often, and you got to be ready to be able to explain it crisply and clearly. I think okay, you're really, I think you're really great at it, really. So. All right, I'm gonna look at it and see if I can make it better. But if, anytime you want to do role playing, that's what I want to do with Marius. That. That you know, uh, uh, it's that's what a coach is. A coach is not there to be a friend. Coach is there to make you win, and that's how that's how I want to be viewed as. I don't want to become people's friend. Well, not you, mm -hmm. but I mean other people that I'm coaching. I want to right. be make right. sure because I'm going to be measured on their success, not whether I'm a a, a good friend to have around. Whether they, got they like you or not, right? Right, not right. They they because like the, the, because at the end, I'm i This is a professional. If you're a professional, if you're a, if you're a professional, then that's how they're going to be judged. You don't want them to become. They can become friend later on, but not in the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Julie, so I, next week I will do the po practice with poetry. Um, I will send you a a, a video today. And then also, I'm going to send you another video by Tuesday. So um, I want to have a few on the queue. Don't, don't make it perfect. Believe me, it's not perfect. No, no, but don't make it perfect. Don't make it perfect. Just, just Believe me, but you know what my problem is? Maybe you can give me some advice on that. Is I spend so much, so much time creating a good script. I don't have time to practice. OK, take your but script. Until the script is good. I don't feel comfortable speaking. Okay, take your script and put it into that flesh Kincaid and then try to simplify it even further. Okay. So you can use that flesh Kincaid and you can even mention that afterwards, after the speech, that here's was my part of it. That's another speech, by the way. How did you prepare? So every time you document that, then that itself becomes a speech. That here's a speech I gave, and now let me tell you how I prepared for this. So that itself, <laughs> so you got actually two speeches in this, by the way. I'm tired of this. All right, speech. I'll do something else. <laughs> yeah, no, take a take a day off and just 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 think about it. And like I said, Tuesday's your drop dead date. At that point, whatever it is, that's done. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right, Julie. Okay. See you later. Thanks, see you next week. Okay. Very much appreciate. Okay, and I'll be sending you emails and stuff. Okay. Bye. Cool. Bye.